Um, it is about an individual journey. Uh, as we said, one emphasizes the kingdom as an experience or condition within the individual person. In the Gospels, Jesus speaks of the kingdom as already present in those who experience God's power over uh, interior forces of evil. That's the born again understanding. We don't negate that. Um, if we then also turn to kind of a second understanding, um, you know what? I think I put the wrong slide in here. I did. And now it's not changing. Okay, there we go. So the second, the second is eschatological. That the gospel really is about um, God's judgment and building to the final day um, or war or chaos uh, or new creation. However, you know, scripture gives us lots of images to, to draw on that. Um, and, and therefore, the gospel is about um, endurance till that new day. Um, God, get me through the, the problems of this world till I get to the next. Um, there we go. I'm suggesting, and, and that also, by the way, is a, is a legitimate um, central focus of the scripture. To suggest that it isn't would make me look rather foolish. Uh, now our world today has kind of gone a bit overboard in terms of what that is all about and how it will come about, but nevertheless there is within scripture this strain that speaks of the day when the kingdom of God which was inaugurated in Christ becomes full, complete, and we as people of faith live in hope and expectation that that, that day will, will come. I'm suggesting a third, and this is not my invention, so I'm, when I say that, I, bear with me. But um, reading from Exodus 19, Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my commandment, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. Those were words over to Moses. Um, there is, I believe, throughout the Hebrew scriptures, one central focus, and that is the covenant. The covenant God makes with the people Israel. And that covenant has its ups and its downs. And frankly, by the end of it all, it has many more downs than ups in terms of the faithfulness of the people to the covenant. God proves faithful always. Patient beyond patience. Um, one doesn't want to challenge God for too long, however, lest one find oneself in exile. But. Um, God has remained faithful to the covenant. That is the witness of the Hebrew scriptures. And for the people, it is a co it's constantly in motion. Um, they try, they succeed to a two on a scale of 10, and then they fail to a negative eight. And it, it, it's just this sine wave of, of, of people, the, the people trying to, to be faithful, um, and yet seemingly unable to do it. Okay, you, you, you're familiar with all this. We've, we've talked about this the fourth time I've shown this slide, so you should probably pretty much have it memorized, that the world that, that Israel, and by that I mean Israel and Judah at one point, the two, the two nations, but the people Israel uh, lived in um, was what perhaps some of us would call the real world. Okay, um, which is a world seemingly contradictory to or opposed to the world as it would be lived in covenant. So we can talk politics here if we'd like. The, the, the political world in which the Israelites live their lives um, are... Um, 
intersect with, with a world that is somewhat, well, no, it is completely anti-covenant. So we find these realities that instead of God being the king, there is now, um, there is now a monarchy. There is hereditary succession. Uh, there has developed um, an aristocracy, uh, a division of um, a division between the wealthy and the poor. Uh, we find this particularly in David's and King and Solomon's kingdom. Uh, there is nepotism. There is the corvée. There is forced labor. Um, David and Solomon both want to build this nation, and um, Scripture tells us they are not above using forced labor to do that. Uh, there's conscription into the armies, which is why the monarchy was established in the first place, right? They were threatened from outside. While they were in the tribes, it was okay. Everybody was weak. But as the Assyrians rose, uh, there was need for a standing army to protect the kingdom. So they call for a king. Uh, there's a conscription. There is unequal wealth, as we mentioned, unequal land ownership. This is a biggie, and we'll get into this later. Land ownership in Israel is a huge issue um, that creates incredible chaos for the people, uh, and then taxes. On the religious end of things, um, you have national and uh, religious leaders uh, involved in international alliances. Uh, there are judicious marriages, uh, pagan influences, pagan shrines, religious tolerance, um, lavish religious patronage, uh, even the temple and location of the, the temple, even the design and, and location of the temple speak of Hellenistic influences. So what we have, trying to, trying to cons you know, make this a little bit more concise, is a, a people who are wedded to the idea of covenant life with God some of which who still hold on to the ideals which were most prominently lived in the days of the judges, but who are now find themselves living in this world under David and Solomon and all the minor kings that come after them, the division of the monarchy. All of these things tend to start going wrong. It actually is the fulfillment of Numbers, I think it's 21, where... where um, they asked for a king and, and Moses, Moses, no, not Moses, Samuel uh, tells him, fine, you want a king? All of these things will happen. Remember, we read that last week. Uh, and in fact, they did. Okay. So where I need to go with this is to make that leap from the days of Israel, the demise of Israel, um, those centuries of Israel being conquered by other people and still living uh, in all of this just by different rulers and heretics at different times to the time of Jesus. And if Jesus came to bring salvation, in other words, the forgiveness of sins, um, new life, if he, if he came to initiate or reestablish uh, the kingdom of God uh, as a way of life and living, um, the question for me has become over the last several years, uh, the question for me revolves around the question of Jesus as a political figure or not. So I don't care how you phrase the question, was Jesus politically active? Was he a political activist? Did he involve himself in political conversations of his day? Was Jesus concerned about political matters? Um, I'm trying to remember my next slide. Traditional interpretations, and you probably all know this, suggest that no. We're, we're, we're ultimately afraid of this thought. Uh, for good reason, by the way. Traditional interpretations uh, of the issue say, no, Jesus' execution took place either because his intentions were misunderstood or because the religious leaders were jealous and afraid of his influence with the people. That's the traditional understanding, right? That's what we've been taught since we were children in, in, in Sunday school, that the bad Pharisees and Sadducees and many of them were not healthy, but um, that they were, they were the ones that were really afraid of Jesus. 
uh, that, that they were afraid he was perverting the religion or he was jeopardizing their power base. And therefore, they were the ones that wanted him dead, dead and gone. What I've come to understand is, and I don't, I don't, <laughs> I just realized this comes off a, this sentence here comes off a little arrogant, folks. But when we clear our head of what we've been taught for so long, the fact that Jesus is intimately involved in politics, political discussions in his day, become more than obvious when you read the scriptures, i.e., the Gospels in particular. Um, it's more likely that we have been, like, like blinded. We've, we've not been uh, allowed to see it or understand it. We're much more comfortable with the first two ideas that it's about personal salvation or it's about um, eschatological endings and, and rebirth. Um, I have personally come to the conclusion that as worthy as those are, and they are worthy, they, they are worthy of our consideration and our devotion, um, I can no longer ignore the fact that Scripture speaks awfully powerfully to the fact that Jesus was highly involved politically. And the way we're going to attack this today or, or come to this um, is through his death first. Um, next week, we'll, like I said, next week we'll look at Scripture passages that that kind of make the point that the, 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 all the scripture passages that we read that can be taken one way or another can also be taken in a different tone and in a different context. Um, we've chosen not to consider those contexts, but they are legit nevertheless. Today I want to consider, and it's a timely discussion because of course Holy Week is, begins a week from today. Palm Sunday is next Sunday. Um, so we start with, with some of the obvious. That um, Jesus, the Romans crucified Jesus. Of this there is no historical doubt. If you're a historian, where's Jay? Jay's, not, Jay's singing in the choir today. Thanks, Jay. Um, there is no credible historian who will deny this fact. Now, whether Jesus was resurrected or not, whether he was Lord or not, of course, historians will play, play that game. But as historical fact, there is more than enough evidence um, to make this an, an unqualified truth. Okay. So the Romans crucified Jesus. Among the Romans, crucifixion was reserved for political extremists, for those proved dangerous to civil order or disorder. No, civil order, hello. Um, this too is kind of beyond question. That this was the form of execution for, for rebel rousers, for, um, what are the words we use for people who subjugate the government or try to? Traitors. Um, they found themselves on the cross. If you robbed a store, you didn't get crucified. It went much easier on you. You were beheaded. Much easier. Much less painful. But for those who proved themselves to be dangerous to civil order, which Rome prized above everything else, crucifixion. So the question becomes, did the Roman governor In addition, did Pilate have enough evidence to crucify Jesus as a public menace? And I've come to understand through the scriptures that the answer is an unqualified yes. And we'll look at those scriptures next week. Um, although we won't look at all of them because just about everything in all the Gospels speaks to it. So get ready. Uh, as a matter of historical truth, the Romans, in conjunction with the Jewish leaders, had good reason to execute Jesus. His words, his actions called for considerable radical social and political change. By addressing such matters, Jesus is known as a threat to civil order. And 
as we go through the scriptures next week, you'll see what I mean. Yeah. Absolutely. So if, if you think, um, what's, what's the word? Power players in a culture. Influencers, and I don't mean social media influencers. Um, the Romans and the Sadducees, and, and we, tend to lay, we tend to paint them with one color, and that's grossly unfair of us, but um, we'll play that game for, for the bit here and to make the point that the, the, the Sadducees in particular had thrown their luggage in with the Romans. In other words, there are two ways to, to look at this. You can, you can battle the Romans and lose, or you can try to get along with them. And many of the Sadducees and Pharisees understood that there was some merit to the argument that you try to get along with them because the other is just sure destruction. What happens in that milieu, what, what happens in that kind of environment, however, is that, that you also begin to create a, a class of power players. And so, yes, the Sadducees and the Pharisees had, for the most part, bought into Roman leadership. They, and, and other things, by the way, which we also get to, um, they had become, um, part, and let me put it this way, instead of Sadducees and Pharisees going to the Roman government to speak for the people, what had happened over time was the Sadducees and Pharisees now went and spoke to the people on behalf of Rome. That may be one way to look at, look at this. They had an investment. They were invested in, in Rome's success. We go back to the idea and understand this from the viewpoint of the covenant. This is critical. And that's why I just keep saying covenant, covenant, covenant. Where you have a leadership that is invested in one thing, and the mass of people, or at least a significant number of people, who are living day-to-day uh, -day lives, who, who strive and struggle to be faithful to the covenant and covenant ideas, you have a problem. You have conflict. Another word for that kind of conflict is politics. Yeah. <laughs> and I think the Jesus crucifixion is a perfect example of a collision between the realm of the physical politics yeah. and the spiritual politics. So, yes, the idea that Jesus is just worried about my soul going to heaven is, in one sense, a very pleasant thought. Um, well, no, in a whole lot of ways, it's a very pleasant thought. Um, but to assume that he lives in the environment he lives in and pays no attention whatsoever to it and is so otherworldly is just stupid. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just naive in, in my book. Even looking at the scriptures, it just becomes impossible. It... it um, it's a pretend world where Jesus doesn't really, um, in, in so many ways, Jesus becomes irrelevant. The only relevance he has is getting me to heaven, getting these people um, to ignore their plight and think about heaven. In, in which case, who was it who said religion is the opiate of the people? And that becomes true if, if, if Jesus is just about allowing people to, to, to bear their burden so that when the great by and by comes their way, 
um, all is well and good, it, it quite literally makes Jesus irrelevant to the everyday life of people. And he did that a few times too, by the way. Yeah, he did. You know, but, um, but instead of influencing anybody, he'd influence. Yeah. So next week we'll look at, at you know who does he spend his time with? What does he teach? And I'm I'm trying desperately not to get ahead because it's we, we've got to get there right before we we um, we delve into to. The exacts, the, the the exact teaching. By the way, the last next week is my last week teaching, and there's no. You will get two or three examples of scripture, and then for us it becomes a matter as a people of faith of then looking for the political aspects of Jesus' ministry when we go about our Bible studies, when we go about our devotions. Um, to move beyond our, our, our own vested interests of, of praying, you know, the burdens I have and the burdens of my friends and all that, and um, to also look in, in the scriptural passages of, of how Jesus is addressing the immediate concerns of the people immediately present with the assumption that he is immediately concerned with the world we have immediately before us. Um, so he's crucified by Rome. The insignia uh, means something to the effect of the Senate and the people of Rome. Rome, to a degree, is understood as one of the first democracies. I use that in quotes. Um, it's, to some degree, a little bit like um, early American democracy, where some people were included, in, but a whole lot of people weren't. Um, so, so we need to, to, to look at life in Jesus' time under Rome. So what's the environment that, that he, is, he is enduring? What's the environment he's living in? Uh, what is the environment of those he is living among? So, some obvious stuff. In Jesus' day, Rome was the master of the universe. Um, <laughs> they really didn't want it any other way, you know. <laughs> they, they weren't, they, they wanted to keep it this way, right? The Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, um, wasn't in place so that Rome could make a witness to the world of how peace was to function, it was to keep Rome in power. Um, social, political, and economic circumstances within Israel worsened under Roman rule. Remember that? The, the, um, the slides, the black slide several slides ago. Um, all of these things are still in place in Jesus' day. Rome didn't change any of this as didn't the Hasmoneans or the Persians or the Greeks. It just kept getting worse and worse. Um, we know historically that in the time, so Rome takes control, the date given is either 63 or 67 BC. They take control of, of what we would call Palestine today, or Israel. Um, from 63 BC to 70 AD, remembering that in 70 AD, Rome finally crushes um, Jerusalem and the temple forever, and there is never going to be there's never going to be, or is to be, uh, another nation or another temple. Um, throughout that 100 plus season of years, there are all manner of rebellions. So yes, you have the Pharisees and the Sadducees playing their part. <clears throat> they're, they're the ones that are kind of 
trying to keep the peace with Rome, they are the ones also profiting from Rome. On the other hand, there are still um, many sectors of society that are not happy. And they're not happy to the point where they will create chaos. Right? Uprisings. They happen every five or six years. Um, <clears throat> this is documented. This, is, this again, is, is history. This is part of the world that Jesus is born into. It defines the world he's born into. It is a world, a region in particular, with great conflict and division. Um, and of course, when there's conflict there and there's division, there are always those who get the brunt of it, suffer the most from it. And there are even those, however, that will profit from it. Um, Herod, um, by the way, both Herod I and II, Herod was the first, he ruled in Rome by Rome's authority until I think 3 or 4 AD, and then his son, Herod Antipas, took power. Um, he sought in many ways to, to pacify the Israelites. Um, but he could not do it at the expense of distressing Rome. So he is walking a, a, a tightrope. Uh, both of them are walking tightropes. Because of the continued, um, where is it, there we go, the continued uprisings that take place, Herod Antipas II, uh, Herod, um, is disempowered. And Rome brings in a governor. His name is Pontius Pilate. We're familiar with that name. He is brought in because of rebellion. Again, I say that because it speaks to the world in which Jesus is living in. Important for us to understand that. He comes to power in 26, 27 AD. Uh, he was removed in 36 AD for sending cavalry into synagogues um, and holy places on Mount Gerizim um, and leveling them. So he ended up causing more chaos than is helpful, which tells you something about Pontius Pilate, which kind of contradicts what we think the Gospels say about him. The Pontius Pilate was a friend of the Jews. He was never a friend of the Jews. Historically, there's, <laughs> there's no evidence that, <coughs> um, that he was looking out after the welfare of the Jews. He was there to maintain peace. It was Pontius Pilate who garrisoned um, a legion of Roman troops in the quarters of the temple, amongst the immediate confines of the temple actually just outside on the corner post um, to ensure peace. This is the world that Jesus lived in. Um, this side's out of place. It should have been before all this. Dang. Um, other influences that are creating havoc. And those of you who are uh, like to study antiquities or um, uh, Greek history, um, know the incredible influence that the Hellenistic um, culture held over a good part of the known world, um, really from about 300 BC to well into the 80s. I mean, long into the 80s. Um, and we see this, if you've been to Israel, You'll have seen a lot. You, you've, you will have noticed a lot of the Greek influence, uh, particularly in the architecture. Even the temple, even the temple is designed um, in Hellenistic architecture types. Um, but Hellenism and, and, and 
I'm not downing Hellenism, I, on the contrary. I mean, look at it, the arts, literature, theater, architecture, music, mathematics, philosophy, science, athletics, come on! The gymnasium. Um, the Hellenistic influence held Rome strongly in its grips. And Rome continued, um, although they beaten Greece, they, they continued the march of Hellenistic culture. So that we, when you go in and look at the ruins in uh, Jerusalem to this day, you will go into um, some quarters and you'll see architecture. Um, in, in that area of ancient Jerusalem, w that was the home to Pharisees and Sadducees. These are very luxurious, luxurious homes. Designed via Greek architecture. So again, we're, we're looking at those who, who are supposedly leading the people, running the temple, all that stuff, um, also falling heavily under the sway of, all, of modernity, we'd say it that way today, um, that these things become um, the things that are sought after, valued, highly prized, um, with things of tradition or covenant thinking going by the wayside, even in temple practice. So this is the world, again, that Jesus is living in. Um, so again, out of this, sorry about this. Uh, first Herod continued building the Hellenistic style. His son continued that, um, even to the point of creating cities designed um, to be Greek type cities, Tiberias and Sephoris. Um, those who just went on the last trip to Israel, we stopped, excuse me, we stopped in, in uh, Sephoris and saw the, the, um, the temple that was there, the synagogue that was there. That synagogue existed um, in, in what was by design a Hellen, uh, Hellenistic community ruled by Rome. Um, we've talked about this, that the temple itself um, is, is designed in, in Hellenistic styles. Um, here we find Roman rule brought about increased trade and commerce, <clears throat> which led to an increasingly cosmopolitan society that more and more adopted Hellenistic ways. The temple itself played an important role in urban prosperity in Jerusalem by attracting numerous pilgrims. So what's going on as Jesus is entering the city of Jerusalem, dead to the cross? It's Passover. There are pilgrims there all over the place. Um, those pilgrims pay taxes, um, not only as pilgrims, but in their daily life. Rome taxes heavily. Um, but even, even the temple plays its part in creating um, the, the division that the larger culture is going to, uh, is soon going to explode. Nevertheless, despite the fact that Jerusalem is prospering, Israel remains an agricultural region. Um, Manufacturing and, uh, and commercial endeavors, you know, are quite different then than they were are today. But nevertheless, they existed. The rural areas didn't get any of the advantage. All they got were the taxes. So I'm going to make a bit of a comparison here. It's 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 not a great comparison, um, um, but hopefully you'll just kind of get where I'm going. Um, the South in America is much more rural than the North. Um, we can think of it in those terms, the Bible Belt versus the, the godless North. Um, in, in Israel, the rural communities are much more able to remember the covenant, to focus their lives on the covenant. 
In the cities, they are laid down with modernity, with all the little teases that cultures offer, um, which we um, just talked about. So again, you see the world Jesus is involved in lives, uh, breathes, has his being, um, travels through. We know he spent time in Jerusalem. We know he spent equal time in the Galilee, uh, in the, the smaller regions. Um, he's in the middle of this religious um, chaos, if we can put it that way. Um, so speaking of the land, earlier I said land is critical to our discussion. Um, to, to understand um, the role that land plays in Israel is um, to take upon yourself a, a decade of study. Books have been written, so to speak. We're going to whittle it down. Um, in the beginning, so now we're in the days of the judges, way back, so we're, we're 900 BC. Um, whoop, wrong one. Uh, at this point in Israel's life, they really kind of had the luxury of being told how to build a just society. Because God gives certain commands that, that say, this is how it is to be. Uh, in the book of Numbers, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, to, those, to these the land shall be apportioned um, for inheritance according to the number of names. To a large tribe you shall give a large inheritance. To a small tribe you shall give a small inheritance. Every tribe shall be given its inheritance according to its enrollment. <coughs> Excuse me. But the land shall be apportioned by lot according to the names of their ancestral tribes they shall inherit. Their inheritance uh, shall be apportioned according to lot between the larger and the smaller. The upshot of this, the beginning and ending of all of this, is that every person was given land in every tribe, except the Levites, the priests. They, if I can put it this way, they lived off the others. They brought their tithes, uh, their offerings. Um, so there is, in the time of the judges, um, an equality that begins to represent what we might call the Ten Commandments. If we're going to remember real quickly the Ten Commandments. Four vertical commandments, how I relate to God. Six horizontal commandments, how I deal with my neighbors, with my family. Um, it is one of many different understandings of the covenant or explanations of covenant living in the Hebrew scriptures. They all tend to go to this notion that life in community is about justice and fairness and equality. It was easy back then because there was no wealth. These people were basically scraping a living out of a land uh, where their neighbor may still even be a Canaanite. Um, so this, this ethos of their covenant with God, I will be their God, they will be my people, um, is, is, um, contained and is built and is understood to be, um, lived out in a just community. Um, what happens, of course, when you establish a monarchy and all this other stuff begins to unfold? Problems. Problems happen when, when all of this begins to unfold. There is a sense, I, I, I have no problem really admitting this, there is a sense that this is utopian. We would call it that today. The, the, the ideal of the covenant is utopian in that uh, the kingdom of God has begun, but it's not going to be completed. We can't complete it because we are fallen critters. 
nevertheless, the ideal is there. Uh, and where there is an ideal, there is hope. And when that hope is crushed, you have division and discord. Um, by the time Jesus finds his footing on earth, in Israel, land was held not by individuals, now, there are some, but for the most part now, large tracts of land are under Rome's control or um, the control of investors because small farmers found themselves in debt very quickly once they paid their taxes, uh, had to worry about expanding populations, and um, had a bad year or two. They would have to sell their land. And all the rich folk in Jerusalem had all this money, and there were no 401s to invest it in. So they bought land. They bought land away from people. So what you have then is even the land, which is so central to Israel's identity, to um, the focus of the covenant itself, so basic um, to me being able to control my life and not be controlled, um, that ideal is now gone. It no longer exists. Um, to the point that in one of the stories we will talk about next week, there are day laborers who are looking for employment. Um, so many that not all of them get hired. ones that are hired are paid a denarius a day, which feeds a family of four. If you do not work, um, there, there's another aspect. Um, I forgot about this in terms of, of, no, I did talk about it. Never mind. Martin Goldman, the idea that, that the wealthy in Israel or in Jerusalem had to do something with their money. Um, and, and economically, they, they couldn't invest it. There, such things hadn't been invented, um, so they bought the land. Uh, we, we did, in fact, talk about that. Um, going back to the idea of covenant, then, what are we to do when we're living in the, the, the world of the, the black slide, where both politically and religiously, um, the population is in chaos? Um, <clears throat> wh wh where do you go? Um, where do you go when you believe in your heart that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it? Where do you go when, when that world is so topsy-turvy um, that you no longer recognize it as a covenant community that you've been told about it, your Passover celebrations forever and ever and ever. Um, traditions, this is how I put it, traditions shape the way people regarded the crucial issue of land. Whose is it? How is it to be used? And for whose benefit? Fundamental to Israel's notion of covenant community is the idea that the land is a gift from God for the well-being of the community as a whole. Possession of a part of the land um, is not an absolute right, but a trust and a responsibility, which is why every 49 years you had a jubilee, or the ideal was to have a jubilee, and all the land went back to its original owners, the families. Um, my point being, this is the world Jesus ministered in. Um, David, Kaler, it's David, I misspelled it. I misspelled my own name. Uh, a quote from his book, Jesus the Prophet. Uh, the egalitarianism of this early system began to break down under the hereditary monarchy founded by David. We talked about this. Uh, only military necessity caused, caused a reluctant Israel to adopt a system of government. 
A new wealthy class associated with royalty began to develop large land holdings in spite of prophetic denunciations. See Isaiah, Micah, Amos. Uh, Israelite kings themselves came to own large estates worked by peasants, slaves, forced labor. Such labor practices helped account for the breakup of the Davidic mon monarchy after the death of its second king, Solomon. Uh, he had all those lists of kings that ruled in chaos after um, Solomon because the people were in chaos. They knew what covenant looked like. And they knew they weren't living in it. Uh, alienation of family property and the development of leading, of leading at in, lending, sorry, lending at interest led to the growth of pauperism and the enslavement of defrauding debtors and their dependents. This destroyed that social equality which had existed at the time of tribal, the tribal federation. Judges. Um, there's one more, I think. All, all part of Kaler. The idea of uh, social equality remained, especially in the northern kingdom of Israel, away from Jerusalem, in other words, up. Um, even after the development of monarchy, the accounts of such early prophets as Elijah and Elisha show strong challenges to monarchy from the point of view of the older, more egalitarian ways. They assert the power and authority of God over the land, its fertility, and its just use. Again, the point. This is the world Jesus walked. Um, and it's because he walked in this world and was engaged with it. We'll see next week. It's because this is the world he walked in and engaged in it that he was crucified. Um, we have the nice little stories of Pilate and Jesus narratives added um, for their own reasons, the author's reasons. Um, but the, the, the most interesting challenge, I, I think, is, is to know who, Her or who Pilate was um, and then go on to suggest that, that Pilate offered the people a deal. I have to find out what really is going on in those, that, that conversation between Jesus uh, or Pilate and the people. We want Barabbas, no. I want to give you Jesus, no. It's a nice story. If you know Pilate, you know there's another purpose to that story, not history. Um, that Pilate would have ever let himself be engaged with the people in that way, bargaining, is somewhat ludicrous. There are reasons for the stories, though. We'll get into that next week. Um, Jesus dies on the cross because in his teaching, preaching, and daily activity, he addressed social issues and injustices in ways that threatened, threatened Roman rule and priestly advantage. Folks, it's all about salvation, eschatology, and politics. I've heard quietly the last time somebody telling me Christianity isn't, about, isn't political. On the contrary, it's at the center of it. And next week, we'll look at the scriptures that prove my point. I think prove my point. Um, we'll go from there. We got about five minutes. Questions, thoughts, angry dissertations? Yeah. Mm -hmm. then what does that say for us in the church? That if we are faithful, um, we make ourselves a target. But to the extent that we are comfortable, aren't we in the same place as the church? Mm -hmm. so. Well said. Mm -hmm. To a church that is is sorry, used, used to privilege. Um, this take um, calls us to something other. It calls us to crucifixion. I'm not too keen on the thought at one level, thank you. Um, it is also to my detriment that it has taken me 65 years to get to 64 
years to get to this point. All of us, all of us for that matter. We are so used to Christianity being a privileged position in our culture uh, and, the, and the theologies we've, we've uh, encountered just kind of build on that. We're special, we got it. Uh, we call ourselves a servant people, but to what degree do we mean that? And servant to who becomes an issue. Yeah, Michael. You're a steward. Yeah, and <laughs> from the Jewish perspective, what belongs to Rome? But, yeah, your heart is not owned by Rome, but, but even, to the, even to ask the question, if you're of a covenant mindset, to even ask the question or to suggest that Rome has any power, has any ultimate sway, um, it, was a trick, it was a trick comment. Nothing belongs to Caesar. Not a thing. Everything. Now, we, now we have to live our lives. Yeah. We live in the real world. How we do that becomes the, the trickiness of living faithfully. But that trickiness can't be ignored, which I think we have confidently done for, for centuries. Um, assuming that, that in, in our case as Americans, that our government is in league with God. Uh, as I think every government thinks they are in league with God. Um, so do we. I would like to believe that. I don't. It's an ideal. It's a hope. Maybe we're partly there, maybe we're not. I don't. But, good point, Michael. Any other thoughts or questions? Yes? Is a really <laughs> I always leave it to you to bring up real simple one-line answer questions. Uh, and darn, look at the time. <laughs> um, how God works in the world often remains a mystery to me to this day. Uh, it always will. Um, I, I, I'm going to suggest that, that no matter the circumstances, um, no matter the time, place, um, that, that God works uh, redemptive purposes. Um, and in, in that sense, I mean all three. Redemption of the individual, redemption of time, eschatologically, and redemption um, of the, the social and cultural climate wherever we are. That God works for the redemption. How God uses Rome or... Um, all that is it's above my pay grade. Take a course at Malone, and, and uh, maybe they've got a more precise answer than that. But um, it, For me, it, it always is going to come down to redemption, and redemption has many different forms um, over a span of all kinds of time. Okay, let's close in prayer because i got to get my sermon ready. i got to write a sermon. Oh, no, 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 no. Gracious God, we give you thanks for time together. I thank you for listening ears um, that you might stir in all of our hearts a, a deeper understanding of the gospel. Uh, it's good news for us uh, today, tomorrow, and well into eternity. Guide us and guard us in the ways of your cross, especially as we come close or draw close to, to Holy Week. 
um, keep us mindful of, of, of the cross that stands before us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, go in peace. If you can. Thank <laughs> you.